Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our monthly heart health lecture series. My name is Dr. Dennis Goodman. I'm a clinical professor of medicine in the Department of Cardiology and specifically the Department of Preventative Cardiology. And I'm director of the Integrative, and Integrative Medicine Program at the Leon H. Charney Division of Cardiology. Next slide. So just some housekeeping here. Uh, we always get a lot of questions and easy way to answer questions. We're all very familiar now with Zoom. There's a Q&A box at the bottom there. You can just tap on that, click that, and you can ask your questions. Um, and I will field the questions during the, even during the time the speakers are, are speaking. And I will ask as many as I can at the end of our lectures. Next slide. So I'm very proud to tell you that uh, we really work hard at getting the best of speakers and the coming up programs are diabetes and your heart health. It'll be a diabetes update with all the latest and new medications Tuesday, Tuesday November 16th. In December, we've got a, a lecture on tips to avoid anxiety and depression over the holidays. And then in January, congestive heart failure will be prevention and the latest treatments. To register, you can visit nyulangone.org slash heart health lectures. Next slide. So these are some of the topics we've had over. We're close to 50 lectures now since I started this series a few years ago. And you can see some of the topics that we've actually been and discussed, been through and discussed. And these lectures are extremely well received and uh, well attended because I think Everybody's interested in prevention, and that is what we focus on. Turns out one of the great lectures we had was on aspirin by Dr. Berger, and he is back to speak to us today. A little more about that as soon as I introduce him. Next slide. So I'm very, very, very excited about the fact that we now have a lecture library, which means you can go to YouTube and you just have to look, you can just have to search for Heart Health Lecture Series or NYU Langone Heart Health Lecture Series. And there are many, many of our lectures that have been recorded and you can watch them in your own time. And as you will see, you have the ability to hear the lectures anytime you want, let your friends know about them. But I do have one favor and request that you don't choose to listen to the lectures after they're recorded, but that you stay with us and get to hear these things live. It's just in case you get to miss one, you can always go back and listen. Next slide. So this is the way you can keep in touch with us. Our website, nyulangone.org slash hearthealthlectures. We have an email, hearthealth at nyulangone.org. And you can also get through to us with Twitter at nyucvdprevent. Next slide. So here is a website, nyu.langone.org slash hearthealthlectures, which gives you all the information about the upcoming lectures and the ability to sign up and also the link to the YouTube lectures. So it's my great pleasure today to welcome and to introduce two great speakers, both rock stars. Um, Dr. Berger has become a close friend of mine and Dr. Myers is really an amazing lecturer and speaker and amazing things are happening at NYU when it comes to cardiology and cancer treatment. And you're gonna be hearing about that today. A little more about Dr. Myers. She's a clinical associate professor and director of the Palmetto Cancer Center survivorship program. She's board certified in internal medicine and medical oncology. She received her MD at NYU and completed her residency at NYU and oncology fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Her practice is largely devoted to treating people who have breast cancer. She provides comprehensive care with a goal of improving overall lifestyle and health during and after treatment. She also works to advance clinical trials on survivorship. She's considered one of New York Magazine's best doctors in New York and recognized as Castle Connolly Top Doctor Series for the New York metro area. She's quoted widely in the media on the topic of breast cancer and is proud and privileged to work with the wonderful healthcare professionals at NYU Langos Permanent Cancer Center. Well, we are proud and we are blessed to have you as part of the NYU faculty, I thank you very much for coming here today uh, to be on our program. And uh, I'll hand it over to you and I'll introduce Dr. Berger before he speaks. Thank you, Marlene, for joining us today. 
Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here. Um, and Dr. Berger and I have a long collaboration, which uh, which we will speak about. And thank you, Dr. Goodman, for inviting me. Um, I am really, really excited to talk about this topic. If we could go to the next slide, please. So I think when, when most of us think about cancer treatment, the first thing that comes to mind is not the heart. Rather, we tend to think about blood counts and hair loss and feeling sick and mortality and just lots of other things. But the heart is really not up there in what I think most people think about. So what is this cardio-oncology business and what's the basis for this? It's not something new, but actually it's something that has, that has garnered much wider acclaim. And that's because of the fact that we now have incredible sur survival gains in cancer. And up until several years ago, as oncologists, we would be really happy that people survived, that we cured people or that people lived longer. And we didn't really give all that much thought to the sequelae of cancer treatment and to the sequelae of a cancer diagnosis. It was just really good enough that someone survived. But now we are having so many more survivors that we really have to think about what the long-term effects of survival are. We know that some cancer therapies increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. And we now know that cardiovascular disease is the second cause of death in cancer survivors after cancer recurrence. And very importantly, there are many shared risk factors in breast cancer, but in other cancers as well, that both increase the risk of cardiovascular complications and the risk of developing a cancer or having a cancer recurrence. And those risks include things like diet, physical activity, smoking, early menarche, and hormone replacement therapy. So there's a lot of intertwining actually between the fields of, of oncology and cardiology that we're trying to to leverage more and more. Next slide, please. There is, as you can see, an overlap an overlap between cardiovascular disease and cancer. And if you look at the bottom line and go across, you can see that the dark, the solid line is cancer risk. And that, as we've known for a long time, increases as we get older. But eventually levels off. But you can see with the dotted line that cardiovascular disease events continue to increase as we get older. And in fact, at some point, they do cross each other where it is a bigger risk than cancer itself. Next slide. I sometimes wonder when I'm seeing people um, and talking about the side effects of treatment and what we hope to accomplish treatment, it often crosses my mind is the treatment worse than the disease? Are we, are we treating people so aggressively? And yes, we're making strides and they're doing so much better. And we have many, many more people who are cured, particularly of breast cancer. But we always have to keep in mind when making treatment decisions and giving our patients options, we do have to keep in mind that cardiovascular disease is still the leading cause of mortality in women, particularly older women, rather than breast cancer. And we also have to be very mindful and work on the fact that we have overlapping risk factors. And when we offer people treatment, we also have to think about, will the treatment make the cancer risk less, but the cardiovascular risk higher? So we have to kind of mitigate these two factors and find the best way to treat and approach our patients. Next slide. As you can see, specifically for breast cancer, the bottom line is years from diagnosis. And while the recurrence risk of breast cancer will go down years from diagnosis, you can see at around year eight to nine, there is an overlap where we start to see a greater risk of mortality from heart disease than in fact from breast cancer. Next slide. So why is this so important in survivorship care? And I think that's really the crux of the issue. There's a lot of disagreement about what to call people when they finished cancer treatment or even during cancer treatment. I'm sure many of you have heard the phrase survivor or a person will say they're in remission or they're cancer free. There are lots of different words that one can use when there's no evidence of cancer. But I think the important thing to remember, rather than focus on no evidence of cancer, is we really have to focus on 
who is considered a survivor. And there is an actual National Cancer Institute definition of a survivor, and that is an individual is considered a cancer survivor from the time of cancer diagnosis through the balance of his or her, or her life. Family members, friends, and caregivers are also impacted by the survivorship experience. And I think this is a very compelling definition because we don't have to start thinking about care of survivors when they are actually quote unquote survivors, meaning completion of treatment, but rather we need to start thinking about many of these issues early on from the point of diagnosis. And we need to think a lot about being proactive rather than playing catch up at the end. Next slide, please. By 2030, there will be 22 million cancer survivors in the United States, and that is really quite amazing. And I think the most important thing about this slide is the bottom sentence, where we notice that two thirds of survivors are 65 and older. So of course, as we get older, we're more at risk for cardiovascular disease, for other issues, for weight gain, for a lot of those issues that increase our risk of cardiovascular complications. So it's particularly important to be mindful of this when we think of our people, of our patients who are surviving cancer, many will be older and we have the combination of comorbidities, not only cancer, but cardiac disease and other issues as well. And you can see on the following slide, please. You see how dramatically and what success we plan on making over the next 15, 20 years. You can see that as people are living longer, and especially in the older age range, the number of cancer survivors are exponentially increasing. And we expect by 2040 to have many, many more cancer survivors, over 25 million. And that's an enormous number of people that we expect to need to take care of. Next slide. I always, I always tell people that cancer treatment may end, but the cancer experience unfortunately does not. And it can get better and things change and people, many, many people who have survived cancer do well, but surviving comes with a price. And this is something that we've been aware of for many, many years. This article, this editorial in the New England Journal is from 2013. And I think it makes a lot of important points. And one is it's important to put into context that while radiation and cancer treatment have caused some issues in terms of cardiovascular disease, it has allowed breast cancer and other patients to survive in the first place. We also know that until recently, and I'm proud to say that we've really been working very hard on this, that there has not been enough focus on cardiovascular disease prevention. And we need to think about cardiovascular cancer survivorship issues at the time of diagnosis, not years. We, we shouldn't wait to play catch up. Next slide. So just a little bit about the basics, about what is the heart. Some, some of you may have no idea that the heart is one big muscle, essentially. And if we look at the components, what we're really interested in is those big red and blue things are the blood vessels that go to and from the heart. The main part of the heart is the muscle, which is often, often takes the brunt of cardiovascular complications. And then the blood vessels that are going down the front of the heart are what is commonly associated with things like heart attacks or myocardial infarctions. Next slide. When we, cardiotoxicity basically means a decline or a decrease in cardiac function. And while there are many ways for this to occur, the three main ways vis-a-vis -vis cancer treatment are direct muscle damage, and that comes with some chemotherapy drugs, called anthracyclines. It can also occur with <clears throat> other targeted types of therapies, such as drugs like trastuzumab or Herceptin. We can see alterations in how the blood supply goes to the heart or the hormones surrounding the heart. And lastly, there can be inflammatory inflammation of the myocardium, which is the muscle part. Next slide. 
So what happens to the heart essentially when someone has cardiomyopathy, which essentially means the heart is not delivering the requisite amount of blood and oxygen to other organs. And the heart on the right is a healthy heart. You can see the muscle layers are the light pink and the blood is where the darker pink or red would be. And you can see on the left, the cardiomyopathic heart is a heart where the walls have thinned. The heart looks a little bit more boggy. It's less able to pump blood the way we would like it to. Next slide. And this is just an example of what a chest X-ray would look like in a cardiomyopathic heart. The one on the left is nice and normal. The heart is right in center of the chest. You can sort of see the nice clear lungs on either side. And on the right is the heart that has a cardiomyopathy that takes up a much bigger part of the chest. Next slide, please. We know that some hearts are at greater risk, so there are people that we care for that we know will be at high risk from just from the get-go, and those are people who are older than 60, who are smoking, have diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, obese, and have other pre-existing heart problems. Next slide. And we know that treatments that increase the cardiac risk, as I mentioned, drugs like chemotherapy drugs, radiation, some of the targeted newer therapy, and even newer than that, or immune therapy drugs, can result in a whole host of cardiac damage that range from coronary artery disease to high blood pressure to cardiomyopathy that we just spoke about to arrhythmias, which means abnormal heart beats to thrombosis, which means blood clots. Next slide. I'd like to give you just a little case history as an example, and this is quite a common case history that I would typically see in my practice. And Jean is 40 years old and she has HER2 positive left breast cancer. HER2 positive meaning that there is a protein on her cell which makes the cancer more aggressive and needs to be treated with drugs that can affect the pumping function of the heart. It's, I specifically mentioned that she has left breast cancer because the breast then would be closer to the heart that sits on the left side of the chest. Jean feels well, she thinks she's in good health, but like many younger women, she doesn't see her primary care. She sees the gynecologist periodically, but doesn't really get a health check. She doesn't particularly like to cook and she's working remotely. I'm sure many of you out there can identify with this during COVID, this combination of working remotely and not liking to cook is, a, uh, is really a very bad combination in terms of most diseases, but particularly for heart health, it, is, it can be really problematic. So we know that Jean will need chemotherapy with the HER2 blocker, which is a drug that can decrease the pumping function, and she's going to need radiation. Her BMI, which is a body mass index, is 32. So to get put in perspective, a normal BMI would be up to about 24.9. And her pretreatment labs reveal high cholesterol. Her hemoglobin A1C is borderline, meaning she's at risk for diabetes and her blood pressure is elevated. We also know that her mother had breast cancer and a myocardial infarction or a heart attack in her early 60s. So when I see somebody like this, we normally would take a history, find out all this information, and Jean thinks she's in really good health and not at risk, but we're seeing this, and we know as her doctors that she's at considerably increased risk because of all of these factors. And this is where our wonderful collaboration at NYU Langone with Dr. Berger and his team have come in handy because now we would refer somebody like this to cardio-oncology, not at the completion of treatment, but at the very beginning to be able to optimize their blood pressure, their nutrition, to try to get them into better shape going forward. Next slide. As I mentioned, there is frequent coexistence of cardiac problems in cancer patients, such as aging, tobacco, poor diet, obesity, physical activity, alcohol, and family history. Next slide. 
And there's a very important article also in the New England Journal from around the same time uh, about the risk of heart disease after radiation therapy. And you can see particularly in radiation therapy to the left side of the chest, that used to be really problematic, but we can see on the following slide that there have been many things that have been done technique wise to try to mitigate this. And some of the techniques on the left side are taking a deep inspiration. And if you look at the left side of the slide, you can see that the, the x-ray beams on the bottom when a person has a normal breath is cutting a little piece of that heart out in terms of influence, influencing its effect, the radiation effect on the heart. But on the right, when a person takes a deep breath, it expands the lungs and removes the breast away from the heart and therefore decreases the toxicity. On the right is another technique, which is called prone radiation, where the person is lying on their stomach and getting radiation therapy. And by the breast hanging down, again, the radiation therapists are able to avoid the toxicity of the heart. Next slide. So there's been what we what we liked, what we've seen more and more is a paradigm shift from treatment to prevention. And while the goals of cancer therapy are to promote cure and avoid recurrence and to promote quality of life, and we've done this, we've increased survival, we've decreased consequences of therapy, but we know that many of the drugs we use still cause cardiac toxicity and increase the cardiovascular mortality risk. Next slide. We also know that prevention should start at the beginning, and that comes, as I mentioned, with taking a good history and a physical exam to individualize risk analysis, look to find the patients who are more at risk of cardiac disease, to do risk predict prediction and ultimately prevention strategies from the very beginning and to continue their follow-up care. Next slide. The real world incidence of heart failure is higher than we expected. And while we're much more careful and we monitor people carefully with some of the drugs we use, there is still inherent risk to the heart. And with many of the newer drugs, such as targeted therapy or immunotherapy, we're first learning about the many types of effects to the heart. Next slide. We also have to keep in mind as oncologists, sometimes our patients will come to us and tell us about that they have fatigue. And while we often will say, well, it's just from the chemotherapy or it's from deconditioning, there often can be a cardiovascular risk to fatigue. And we always have to look at the exercise that a person is doing or lack thereof and make sure that that lifestyle change is very important because that can mitigate many of the side effects as well. Next slide. We know that there's major lifestyle opportunities for cancer survivors. As you can see, the chance of an inadequate diet is at 75%, physical activity, 54% prevalence, and smoking and overweight still extremely high. So we have a lot of work that can be done and a lot that can be accomplished. Next slide. I think Dr. Berg is going to talk about Life Simple 7, so I'll skip over that. And key points in terms of takeaway are several. We have to remember that cancer therapy is evolving and chemo and radiation have changed from sort of simple drug-related toxicity damaging the muscle to targeted agents and, and immunotherapy that work differently. The cardiovascular spectrum is changing and we have to look at the inflammatory and immune mechanisms. We're seeing much more in the way of arrhythmias or abnormal heartbeats. And some of the newer features of the drugs that we're coming upon are prolongations of the QT interval, which is something that happens that's noticeable on the EKG. And with that may set up a risk for uh, more arrhythmias. Next slide. We know that cardiac events don't happen to everyone, but there are people at greater risk. Cancer in and of itself is pro-inflammatory and can irritate blood vessels and cause clots. It's very important as a patient to be proactive and ask your oncologist if the drugs can cause heart disease and if cardiac evaluation is indicated. Um, it is important to make sure you're up to date with your primary care, that you're getting your lipids and your blood pressure, your blood pressure checked. And 
one group of people that we often unfortunately don't think about, which is becoming much, much more prevalent is the survivors of childhood cancer who are at enormously increased risk for late side effects. And many of these survivors, while they're 30 to 40 years old, have the hearts of 60 to 70 years old. And as I mentioned, prevention and early diagnosis is the key as is lifestyle changes. Next slide. The task of cardio-oncology is risk assessment before therapy to access pathways to a timely diagnosis and characterize the extent of morbidity and mortality that may occur from cancer treatment. We need to have good therapeutic options and we need to be able to monitor long-term cancer survivors. Next slide. And as a survivor, your task is to do what you can. We know there are risk factors that you can't change, but there are many that you can, such as blood pressure, smoking, diabetes, physical inactivity, obesity, and cholesterol. Next slide. So the bottom line is take care of your heart. It will serve you well. And while the treatments that we use can certainly affect it, there is so much that we can do nowadays. And we're learning more and more every day and collaborating across the spectrum to take care of your heart with you as well. So thank you for attention, for your attention. Um, and I will pass this on to my colleague, Dr. Berger. Dr. Myers, just before you pass it to Dr. Berger, I want to say that was fantastic. I have, uh, you. as you know, heard many, many, many lectures, and that was absolutely up there with the very best in it. In a short amount of time, you gave us so much good information. Thank, so you. thank you. I appreciate thank you. it. Our next speaker is our very own Dr. Jeffrey Berger. I'm not going to go through your whole bio, Jeff, because I don't want to take five minutes away from your talking. Uh, I just want to say how, what a privilege it is to have you as director of our prevention center, and I'll give the audience just a few tidbits about you. Uh, you are an associate professor of medicine and surgery with appointments in cardiology, hematology, and vascular surgery at NYU Langone. He's director of the Center for Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease and director of cardiovascular thrombosis at NYU. His study processes are relevant to atherosclerosis, thrombosis, platelet biology, and different phenotypes of cardiovascular medicine. Dr. Berger received a master's degree in clinical research from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He completed his fellowship in cardiology at Duke University, cardiovascular research training at Duke Clinical Research and Vascular Medicine and Thrombosis and Hemostasis at the University of, of Pennsylvania. Dr. Berger's platelet lab is studying the platelet phenotype to understand who's at risk for developing cardiovascular disease and to determine whether modification of the platelet phenotype can ultimately lower the risk of adverse cardiac events. And that, in short, means that he is working and studying thrombosis and bleeding anticoagulation and has become a world expert in that area. He's received many honors and awards and receives prestigious grant, granting from the, from the NIH and the American Heart Association. Dr. Berger is married with two beautiful daughters, and that's very, very important. I just want to say that we appreciate you, and I especially appreciate you coming onto our program. I know how busy you are, and as, as you know, your lectures are always incredibly well received. So it's a proud moment for me to introduce you to our audience, and to thank you for speaking on this very important and timely topic. Jeff, over to you. Sure. So first of all, thank you, Dennis. Um, 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 it really always is great to um, work with you. It's always great to be on one of these um, panels. These are really incredible opportunities. You know, we spend a lot of time talking with our colleagues. And I think, unfortunately, we probably do not spend enough time talking to people in the community. And you have changed that. And I think, I think the Prevention Center is very grateful for this opportunity. And I think, uh, I think it is great what you are doing. So hopefully this will continue for a long time. Um, it is a, um, a pleasure to be here. Um, 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 it is great to follow Dr. Myers' talk because I think, I think that you know, we, we have um, um, had the opportunity to work together now for a few years. And, and um, as you will hear, you know, we, we, we both have our areas of expertise and it's really incredible to see the cardiology and the oncology community working together. And I think it's really exemplified 
here at NYU Langone Health. So um, um, with that, I will, I will sort of um, take you through um, a little bit about where we are um, um, and I think where we are going. So I'm gonna be talking about optimizing heart health during treatment from cancer. Um, um, and this will sort of follow what you heard from Dr. Myers um, 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 with a little bit of repetition, a little bit of sort of maybe being a little bit more specific, but, but please, you know, for everyone out there, if you have questions, you know, type them in. I see already a handful of them. Um, we're happy to answer your questions. You know, this is sort of, we, we want to um, um, help you and really provide answers to questions that you think are important. So this slide really illustrates the, the, the you know, overlapping importance of cardiology and, um, um, and oncology. And that it is, this is a new field basically. And we are learning so much that what affects oncology affects the heart. And what affects the heart affects your oncological risk, affects your risk of actually developing cancer. And we'll show you some really, really interesting data about that. But I think what this reminds us of is that if you hear somebody talk about heart disease or if you hear somebody talk about you know, cancer risk, you need to realize that these things do not happen in a vacuum. And that when someone is at risk for one, you need to start thinking about the other. Because what is amazing, and I think everyone should be very optimistic out there, is that we do a lot of work on prevention, right? We, we sort of have moved away from this idea of waiting until somebody gets a problem before we can take care of their issue. So, so with all that, let me get started. So I think- uh, Dr. Berger, will you just um, maximize your screen? So oh, is it, sorry, I may be showing you, I may be showing you the wrong screen. Is that better? If you could, uh, yeah, there you go, thank you. Okay, so thank you so much for saying that. I would have never known. Um, okay, so, 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 so clearly um, 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 we have an obligation to take care of patients um, um, and manage their cardiovascular disease in patients with cancer and vice versa. So as I said, cardio-oncology is a rapidly developing field. It seeks to improve patient outcomes to enhanced clinical and research collaboration across both fields of cardiology and oncology. For example, with breast cancer, it is the most common cancer diagnosis among women in the US, as decades of research has resulted in improving outcomes. So you just heard from Dr. Myers that because of all the great therapies that are available, women are living much longer. Survivorship is a great issue to deal with, but unfortunately there is some long-term toxicity that needs to be thought of and taken care of. So the cardiovascular care of patients with cancer, it involves a multidisciplinary collaborative approach. And I think it's imperative for patients in the community to understand that doctors work together. And you know, I think that this is exemplified here at NYU Langone Health, but I think you want your physicians, your oncology physicians to work with your cardiovascular prevention physicians so that we can help take care of each individual patient. So as a cardiologist, I look up to the American Heart Association, which is our sort of you know, premier organization that really sheds light on the risk of heart disease. And as you can see, the American Heart Association, otherwise known as the AHA, has a scientific statement where they are telling you, this is about breast cancer, but they have it for multiple types of cancer, is that there is an intersection between these two types of diseases. And we need to be mindful of that when we see our patients, when we take care of them, either those at risk or with a diagnosis of cancer or heart disease. So as an example, cardiovascular disease and breast cancer are major threat to women's health, right? So when you're looking at the prevalence of the disease, you see that coronary heart disease and stroke are very highly prevalent but so is lung cancer and so is breast cancer. I mean, these are major issues for all um, 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 of our population. And in fact, 
when you think about factors that are associated with the development of heart disease, they're very similar to the development of breast cancer. Thinking about diet, right? A healthy diet lowers your risk of both heart disease and breast cancer. A Western diet, right? That's a diet filled with lots of inflammatory and fat rich foods, increase your risk. Physical activity lowers your risk of both. Red processed meat increases your risk of both. I mean, this is really important for people to realize. The majority of things that are bad for one are bad for the other. So very importantly, please remember this. Cardiac risk factors increase the risk of cancer. That's right. Cardiac risk factors, you know, things that you always thought of, like high blood pressure, like obesity. This is an example. This is, this is sort of meant just to sort of show you that whether you're thinking about obesity on the top left, diabetes in the middle, hypertension, smoking, poor diet, poor physical activity, all of them increase your risk of all different types of cancer. In fact, if you look at the bottom right, you know, with the physical activity, when you do more physical activity, you lower your risk of developing cancer. Now that's very exciting, right? That means when you eat healthier, your risk of cancer decreases. Now, very importantly, cardiovascular risk factors are associated with a future risk of cancer. So here's the data. This is two longitudinal community cohorts, 20,000 participants included, mean age of 50, right? These are young people, 54% are women. A total of 2,548 cancer cases are found over a follow-up of 15 years. The most common subtypes are GI cancer, lung, prostate, and breast. And this is what you see. These are the risk factors that are associated with cancer. So you look for the ones with a p-value of less than 0.05, age, you know, sex, systolic blood pressure was not associated, hypertension treatment, however, was, smoking, etc. But when you put these together, when you create a cardiovascular risk score, People that are in the highest risk, they have the highest risk of development of a future cancer. That means the worse you are, you know, the higher your risk for heart disease, the higher your risk for developing cancer over a follow-up of 15 years. And if you notice, the curves are spreading out, which means it would look even worse if this was followed out to 20 or 25 years. You know, Dr. Myers briefly showed this picture, right? This is Life Simple 7. There are, simple, there are seven things that the American Heart Association says to be mindful of. Diet, weight, exercise, smoking, blood pressure, cholesterol, and sugar. Those are the seven things. Well, when you put all of those into a score, people that are at optimal health in the green line have the lowest risk of developing cancer in the future. People that have a poor cardiovascular health score as seen in the red line, they have the highest risk of developing cancer. So something as simple as taking care of your, you know, cardiovascular health can really impact your future risk of developing cancer. And in fact, for every unit increase in your risk score, you get a 5% lower risk of developing cancer. That's a pretty powerful statement. But very importantly, I talked about cardiovascular risk increasing the risk of cancer. Unfortunately, cancer also increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. So when someone has cancer and you're looking at the long-term risk, you have a higher risk of all different, from all different types of cancer for heart failure, on the left side, venous thromboembolism, which means a blood clot in your leg or a blood clot in your lung, and stroke on the right side, right? This means if you survive from your cancer, you have a long-term risk of heart problems, blood clots, and stroke. That means you have to be really, really mindful now, way before you get out, you know, many, many years later. There is a long-term risk of developing a blood clot in survivors of breast cancer. And I think what's really noteworthy about this, if you can see on the top of this figure, when it goes by age, your risk is highest the younger you are. Meaning breast, can breast cancer 
in this case, but it's really for all cancers, is a stronger risk factor for the development of a blood clot in younger people than it is in older people. So everyone has to be mindful of this. This is really, really important. This, this basically shows that women who are receiving chemotherapy for breast cancer have a higher risk of the development of a blood clot. And the risk is highest when they have their chemotherapy and in the months following. But I just showed you on the prior slide, it doesn't end there. The risk goes on for probably 10, 15, and even 20 years. Now, very importantly, the question is, does cardiovascular disease, not risk factors, but does cardiovascular disease change the risk of cancer? So at NYU, we are privileged to work with some really bright and smart researchers and clinicians. And this is data from one of um, uh, my colleagues. Her name is Catherine Moore, a exceptional scientist who basically showed in a very elegant study that when you have a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, it increases your risk of developing breast cancer. And she showed this using two different models. This is a uh, model in a mouse showing that when you give a mouse a heart attack by tying off their artery, this is by, by um, A, right? So you tie off their artery or you do a sham procedure, which means you open them up, but you don't tie off the artery. All of a sudden by B, you see your risk of developing a tumor, looked at it by its size or by its weight on the right side is increased after a heart attack than after a sham procedure. Looking at the question of does this increase your risk of metastasis, not just of development of a tumor, but the answer is in a model that already had breast cancer, and then you perform the procedure to cause a heart attack, the heart attack causes larger cancers all over the mouse, right? So that's, so that's very important to know that heart attacks increase the risk of cancer in a mouse. The question that I care about, and I'm sure you care about, is what about in humans? And that was answered in the same paper. This was answered by another colleague named Dr. Jonathan Newman, showing that among women who have breast cancer and are cured, um, um, I'm sorry, among women who have a heart attack and, and, and women who do not have a heart attack, the risk of um, breast cancer death is higher in those that have a heart attack. Once again, showing that in humans, if you have a heart attack, you're 60% higher risk of developing breast cancer mortality and breast cancer recurrence. That's a very big deal. Let me just sort of run. If you have a heart attack, you're at a 60% higher risk of developing breast cancer recurrence and dying from breast cancer. So that means they're very intricately intertwined. Now, finally, you heard from Dr. Myers that there are therapies, pharmacologic therapies are medicines that can attenuate, that means that can make better, that can lessen cardiotoxicity. This is just one study, but there are, there are others. This is a double-blind, multi-center, placebo-controlled trial among women with early-stage HER2-positive breast cancer. They're scheduled to be treated with a drug called Cress. Tuzumab for 12 months, and then patients were divided by those who required another drug called anthracycline or not. They were randomized to either getting a blood pressure medicine called lisinopril, a blood pressure medicine called carvedilol, or placebo, which means a fake medicine. They were followed for 12 months. You can see the mean age was quite young at 51 years. Most were white. The baseline ejection fraction, meaning the heart was squeezing normally, and 189 of these women were receiving anthracycline. You see that overall, there was a very small but not significant reduction in the risk of developing heart failure, which means the blood pressure medicines were around 30%, were associated with a 30% reduction in the risk, but it was not statistically significant. But in those that required anthracycline, which is a 
which is a medicine that is toxic to the heart, going on these medicines can prevent cardiac toxicity by around 50%. Now that's pretty amazing, right? That if you start a medicine before they require the cardiotoxicity drug, you can prevent problems. This is why Dr. Myers and I and our groups have partnered. We understand that we need to take care of patients before they start therapy, during their therapy, and we need to continue to follow them to prevent complications. So this is a simplified model for cardiovascular prevention. Dr. Myers is, um, 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 takes care of women with breast cancer, so I um, um, am emphasizing this, but this is really for all types of cancers. If you notice on the left, we need to take care of patients as soon as they get a diagnosis of cancer, when they start treatment, during treatment. And very importantly, we can't stop. We need to continue after treatment. This is how we prevent heart disease. This is how we prevent stroke. And very importantly, this is also how we can prevent recurrence or we can work with the oncologist to prevent recurrence. So this, this is all work that we do at the NYU Center for the Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease. But let me remind you, right? We are just one part of the, of the puzzle. You know, collaborative teams like those that we have set up with Dr. Myers um, um, and some of the other oncologists is really, I think, the way we target some of these problems. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to sort of share that, you know, we have, we have started, right? We, we are now able to work together. We are able to, you know, prevent um, um, or work on preventing both heart disease. Um, um, hopefully that will also have an impact on their risk of recurrence. But this is, this is a big partnership. And I think, I think this is sort of really the future of medicine where different groups get to work together. Dennis, you're on mute. Yeah, I just muted, unmuted. That was really amazing. I mean, I, I hope we're going to give this, this lecture that you've just done to the medical students and our residents, because this is kind of a new field. Most physicians would not know what oncology means. And yet you've seen today what an incredible link there is on both ways. Heart disease increases the risk for cancer and cancer increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. So I've got a whole lot of questions and we're always challenged because there's so many questions and it's hard to answer them all. So I'm going to say, let's try to give a thumbnail answer uh, and get a, a few questions in. And then when one, I, I'm, what I'm hoping to do one day is actually have a Q and A where we just have Q and A for all the questions that have come in uh, over the lectures. And we just have a couple of people answer them. So some of them will go there. My first question actually, uh, Dr. Myers, is, is, is this interesting point that I think I read that one in eight women, you can correct me, do get breast cancer at some point, and maybe and one in 32 will die from breast cancer. And yet one out of every other woman uh, lands up having dying from cardiovascular disease, or well, certainly between one and two and one in three. Yet women are so fearful of breast cancer. How did it happen? that they're so aware of the risk of breast cancer that they'll have a mammogram every year. And we're having trouble, even with AHA guidelines, trying to spread the word as all of us are trying to do in our prevention program, that women don't take on board the risk of cardiovascular disease. I know that's a big question, but maybe you could comment on that. Are we missing? Are we doing something wrong? Thank you. I think it's, a, it's an, a, an excellent question. Um, I think what it comes down to is there's so much publicity around breast cancer, as there should be. And we have Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which is right now. And of course, all of October, everyone's wearing pink and there's walks and talks and lots of that. And, and I think for many women, breast cancer or avoidance or prevention or early pickup um, ends up being uh, a response by getting a mammogram, which is, while it's certainly not pleasant to do, is doable and, and relatively easy. I think if we look at cardiovascular disease, prevention of cardiovascular disease requires in many ways, a lot more work. So of course it requires going to your doctor to see whether you have high blood pressure, et cetera, but it also requires a lot of work 
in terms of your nutrition and exercise and things like that, that we always stress in survivorship as well, and especially for breast cancer. But I think part of it is the public relations uh, aspect of it. But another big part of it is there's so much stress and cardiovascular disease in having to do the hard work. And it, it can be hard work, but the payoff is enormous. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, Jeff, there's a question here about cardiovascular disease. We know it, how it affects breast cancers and other, you know, other cancers, soft tissue cancers, but what about hematological? Uh, the question is, does AML and CML, are they also, do they apply when it comes to what you've said today with respect to cardiovascular disease? So the, so the short answer is yes. Um, you know, th the relationship between um, cardiovascular risk, shared risk factors is similar across different types of malignancies. So I, I, I think, and that really makes conceptual sense, right? Um, um, both cardiovascular disease um, um, and oncological disease is a disease of, you know, altered immunity. It is a pro-inflammatory disease. When you have um, abnormally controlled risk factors like, um, you know, high blood pressure or high sugars or high cholesterol, that alters your inflammation in your body. It alters your immunity. And that makes things worse for both your cancer risk as well as for your risk of heart disease. By the way, if, if I can just add, add a comment to what Dr. Meyer said. So I, I, I completely agree. And I think that's sort of the problem um, or one, one of the problems in society, right? Is that it's always easier to, to take a test or to take a drug. It's, it's hard for people to take some responsibility for their lifestyle. It's just hard, right? Meaning personally, it's hard. I, I know, like I work very hard. You know, I've, uh, I, 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 you know, as you mentioned, I have two children that I love to be with. And, and so you're always struggling between, you know, work and taking care of your family and doing all these responsibilities that you have, plus taking care of yourself. You know, when I talk to patients, I remind them, and I'm very good at telling patients, I'm not very good at telling myself, um, which is that, you know, you have to take care of yourself so that all those responsibilities will get done, right? Because if you don't, they won't get done. Your you know, like you are essential for your family. If you don't take care of yourself, nobody else will. Um, so it's so important that, you know, we remind our patients that it's more than just, you know, a pill. It's more than just getting a test done at a doctor's office, but that they need to partner with us. When there's partnership, patients do better. Jeff, I, I, it reminds me of a wonderful metaphor that I once heard that the first, uh, the heart, which without the heart, we've got nothing. We, the first blood vessels that come out of the aorta go to the heart. In other words, the body takes care of the heart first. And I always tell patients, you know, you can't ignore that. The heart needs to be taken care of. They're the first blood vessels coming out of the aorta that supply the heart. And if your heart's not in good shape, then I'm sorry about that. Then you can't do anything else for yourself or anybody else. So that's, that's interesting. I've got a question here about what tests, Jeff, should you be doing? I mean, is this something that a cardiologist needs to do? Can the internist do it? This is somebody saying, well, what do I need to check for my heart before or during the time? Uh, and maybe you can just comment on how important it is to get this pre-op, pre-cancer or, or pre-cancer therapy evaluation of the heart before anything is done. And I know all oncologists ask for that. But this question is about, do they need a cardiologist? Yeah, so, so, so you know, um, um, I've spent a lot of time with Dr. Myers over the last few years, and we've and we've actually spoken about this exact question, right? Which is, so what do we do? What what are the tests that we want to do? How do we identify people at risk? So so I think I think it's really the basics, right? So you want to check their blood pressure, you want to check you know their weight and their body mass index, um, you want to check their sugar levels. Um, 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 a single time point is probably not the best, so you want to do something called a 
hemoglobin A1C, which is an approximate um, a marker of your sugar over a three month period. And you wanna check your cholesterol. Now, I think those are the basics. Okay. Because I think once you have those, you have a good idea if someone is metabolically healthy or not. If they are not, if there's even an inkling of not, they should be seen by someone. I really believe so. And it doesn't have to be a cardiologist. I'm clearly biased, right? right? Meaning I'm, I'm a prevention focused cardiologist as are you. Dennis, so, so I, I know that you and I, we take great pride in, we don't want to deal with patients once they have problems. We, we spend right. our career trying to prevent problems. So I, I, I never think it's too early. You know, it's, it's funny. In my community where I live, I sometimes get um, um, a comment, I hope I don't need you. And I respond by saying, see me. You know, on the contrary, you know, I want to see people way before they have problems, because I think I think we have to move away from I'm going to see a cardiologist or a physician once I have an illness or a sickness. You should be seeing people way up front to avoid problems. Jeff, and in fact, we say this all the time, 80 percent of heart attacks and strokes are preventable. I mean, in turn of, instead of people saying I don't need you, they should come see you now and then they may not have to see you as much later. Uh, and, and that's your point. I've got a question here. I think this is for you, um, Dr. Meyer. One of your slides showed premenopausal obesity decreased the risk of breast cancer. Can you explain why? Is there a J-shaped curve where severe obesity would increase the risk of breast cancer? This speaks to the, to the issue of obesity weights. How does it play into your risk for breast cancer? So in general, the, the obesity risk plays more into, uh, into postmenopausal women and into breast cancer recurrence and also into whether or not hormone receptors, uh, whether someone is what we call estrogen receptor positive or not. And we know that um, fat cells do make more estrogen and that can be a confounding factor. So the data is a little bit murky in terms of pre and post menopausal and whether someone is estrogen receptor positive or negative. But like I, what I, what I will often tell my patients who sort of like to look, look deeper into data and say, well, there's a study about this and there's a study about that. And it is true that there are some conflicting studies. However, overall, we know that having a good body mass index for cancer, for heart disease, for pretty much everything is better than not. So even if you're not getting an absolute direct benefit to breast cancer, you're getting a benefit in so many other ways. Thank you. There's a question about Tisigna, which causes QT prolongation. What supplements, exercise, drugs can be used to address this? Jeff, let me just say this, and then you, you can add if you want to. The fact is Tisigna does prolong QT prolongation, um, and that puts you at risk from arrhythmias and sometimes very serious arrhythmias. So we tend not to give people to signal if you have an elevation uh, and a prolongation of the QT interval. That's why it's so important to get an EKG and see if you have a QT interval prolongation before, and then your oncologist and cardiologist will talk together about some alternative. There are no supplements or drugs that I'm aware of that can help to prevent that situation. Jeff, do you want to comment on that? No, I completely agree. Meaning, uh, there, as you mentioned, there are no drugs that are used to preempt that. But all it takes is for you to have an electrocardiogram. Right. You know, it, it, it is rare, it is very rare for the QT to be prolonged that much that it will cause a problem. But if you if you get an electrocardiogram before and after, you'll know it's it's it's, it's, it's such a simple do. thing to do. It's easy to do. Jeff, quick one. I, this person says, I've got lymphoma. Do I have a risk of heart disease, radiation, et cetera? And what should they do? Sure. Yeah. Meaning, unfortunately, you know, we have, we have been learning over the past decade or so that there is overlap uh, between almost every type of cancer and heart disease. So, so unfortunately, the answer is yes. But the good news is, is that we have a lot of ways to prevent complications from it and we can prevent it right i just think it's sort of getting integrated early enough with a prevention focused physician so that you can deal with things absolutely there's a question here about it's not a question it's a comment but i've got great lectures these were can they get the slides and as i said in the beginning which they probably missed 
you can go onto our, our website to YouTube and look up Heart Health Series or NYU Langone and all many of these lectures are recorded, including the ones today. You'll be able to get all this information again. I think we're going to end it here. Uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of information packed into your lectures. And I think that we've really shown today how important this topic is. And we're going to shine a spotlight onto this, Jeff, uh, both from the oncology and cardiovascular disease programs. Uh, and I think many more people's lives will be saved uh, by being aware of this very strong interaction. Thank you both for outstanding lectures. I always want to thank my partner, which is Anya, who helps me so much to put these programs together. And she, she's just so, so, so wonderful. I thank you, Anya, for making this happen. And we look forward to seeing you at our next, our next program in a month. Thank you, everybody.